thanks for the introduction, um, Anne. And uh, yeah, it's a great <laughs> pleasure to come and speak to uh, members of the industry again about uh, blight in 2021. And uh, we've already heard the good news that there aren't any blight alerts yet. So the Hutton, Hutton alerts haven't kicked off. So I guess that's the good news. And the bad news, there probably aren't many potatoes around yet, are there? Because it's, uh, it's certainly been awfully cold. Um, I'm seeing stories up and down the country of potatoes just about emerging and a lot of thirsty potatoes. So let us hope that things change soon. Anyway, I'm uh, not going to be talking about that today. I'm going to be talking about something a little bit different. So it's, uh, it is based on the uh, work we've been doing on fight against blight over the years. You can see the rather lengthy title here, Spatiotemporal Analysis of Potato Late, bright, late Blight Outbreaks in Great Britain. Um, and this project was run by Peter Skelsey, my colleague. I used to share an office with him before we got uh, separated by COVID like everyone else has. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, um, and some colleagues also in the Aberdeen section of the James Hutton Institute who are modelling, that's Matt, Malcolm and Mads. And this uh, project was funded by HDB. I'm just going to slide. Um, yeah, uh, blight. I mean, I, you know, I know you all know what it looks like and I hope you don't get any of it. But um, the project is about obviously minimising outbreaks like this, which, as we all know, can be pretty explosive. So what we're discussing today is a lot of information on this slide, but um, is really making the most of the fact that we have a long-term data set here. That because the AHDB have been funding fight against blight for many years now, um, we have two, over 2,700 outbreaks that many of you may, may have sampled for us. So thank you for going out to these crops and um, tracking the, the blight that's been occurring in crops. And we've been genotyping these at the James Hutton Institute, and we now have about 10,000 uh, data points. So we not only have core information about all these 2007 outbreak, 2,700, in fact, more than that now, because you can see the time range is, uh, is expand, expanded, but we also have the genotypes from those sites. So this project really comes about from a, a realization or an understanding that we could use that data for more than just the maps, useful though that the, the um, the plots of population change are, we actually have accumulated a big data set which can be used for many other things. So I've shown the examples of the charts and you saw these if you joined the, the um, meeting in December, where we can see the genotypes, these different colored blocks have changed over time. And we've got data for England and Wales on the top here compared to data from Scotland. And you can see that the genotypes or the different colored clones in those two parts of the country have sort of mirrored each other but there are some quite uh, marked differences as well but it's a big data set i won't go into the detail now about the clones and things i think you're f familiar with that story um so we wanted to use this resource to look at other things and one of the things we've already used this data source for is indeed the Hatton criteria which we've just learned about so it was very useful for the determining that as well okay so that's the data how representative is a, an obvious first question for that data before we started looking into lots of detail. So what we have here is a map of the um, AHDB data set. This is based on the levy board um, information. So do bear in mind that the potato cropping data here shown in the chart on the left doesn't include, of course, gardens and allotments. Um, and there will be a lot of those, but you know, epidemiologically, they um, are probably less important. And what you're interested in is the major potato growing areas, large acreages. So we can see on the left hand side the uh, plot of the potatoes and on the right hand side is a, an amalgamated map of all the samples that have come in um, over the years showing the, the density. And I think the first thing you can see is that in general there's a um, pretty good representation. The areas that are most intense um, in terms of potato co coverage are certainly the most intense in terms of the samples as well. There is a bit of variation, of course, and I've, I've just flagged a couple up where there's quite intense areas of um, potatoes, but relatively few samples by comparison as part of Herefordshire, perhaps. Um, but the coverage is generally good. OK, so we have a, a good data set. So then we've started processing that data and we started off with some fairly uh, clear and obvious things your overall risk of potato late blight. I should point out before I go into much more, many more details on these maps, 
the subunits you see on these maps are postcode districts. Um, so that is DD2 for the area around Dundee, um, Peterborough or Canterbury, for example. So they are fairly large areas in some cases, other areas they're very small, um, but you can see the variation in postcode district. And all the data we've collected in the fight against blight has been on this postcode district for reasons of wanting to be anonymous enough that um, the data is useful and it's localized, but it's anonymous, anonymous enough not to identify individual fields or growers. So that's a, um, a good thing, but it's also, there is a slight weakness and we'll come into that in, um, 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 as we go forward. So this, back to the contents of this map, what we're looking at here is risk of outbreaks. And what we've done is color coded, I'm gonna be saying we in all this, I haven't actually done any of this uh, technical uh, map drawing and things. This is my colleagues, uh, Pete and the modelers up in Aberdeen. But um, what the Royal We have done is to colour these dots, uh, these postcode districts, according to the number of samples that have come in, the number of outbreaks from those areas. Um, and the other thing is that the, dark, the pale grey areas are areas, postcode districts in which there is no commercial potatoes, and the other slightly darker grey areas are where there's very limited areas of potatoes. So um, I think the main point here is that there are areas which are we consider hot spots or there's certainly a lot more samples from some areas than others and but i suppose it's not a tremendous surprise to you that the areas where we've had most outbreaks have been those areas where there's most potatoes growing most commercial potatoes growing perhaps a slight clustering across the coast um, towards the coastal areas in some areas but um, in general we're looking really at the, the, you know, the main potato growing areas and there is variation um, and you can see that the categories we've got here, there's quite a big difference between the 63 um, outbreaks and, and less than five. So there's, there's quite intense hotspots. So blight risk is high amongst all potato growing areas. The next thing we did is to look at the date of each outbreak. So we wanted to see if there were particular areas where blight risk was higher earlier than other areas. So what we've done here is plotted the, we've split all the outbreaks up throughout the whole season. And um, we've categorized those into groups. And you can see now we've got weeks 7 to 28, 29 to 32, and 33 to 41. They're strange categories, I know, but this, these relate to the week of the year. So week seven is obviously a very early outbreak. There weren't many of those. It's probably something under polythene down in the southwest, up to week 28, which is in July. Now, one of the Challenges, of course, with all this type of work, as you all know as growers, every season is different and the potatoes emerge and they're planted at different times and the late blight indeed itself starts at different times. Last season was very late due to all that dry weather. I suspect you know, wherever we're going so far, blight is going to start fairly late this year as well because the primary inoculum is wiped out. So what we're trying to do here is synthesize an awful lot of data from many different years, each of which is slightly different. So I must admit, I looked at this map and thought, you know, I really expected to see some sort of gradation where this, the, in the south the um, crops would be ready earlier and therefore there'd be greater intensity and perhaps blight moving north as we went. But you can see there isn't really a tremendous pattern, actually a tremendous clear pattern. There are clusters of um, earlier outbreaks than other areas. Um, but I think that reflects the, the complexities of um, the season to season variation. Some years, blight has actually started. I think some of the first outbreaks last year were up in Aberdeenshire, for example. So that was unexpected. So there are several focuses of early outbreaks in every year, I suppose, is the conclusion. So that's probably, again, not a tremendous surprise. And there's not, an off, not as much as I was thought might come out of that. Okay, moving on. Um, what we did next was using um, a cluster analysis uh, tool. And this is using, using the Arc, Arc GIS. Some of you may have heard this. This is the kind of global leading uh, geographical uh, spatial in integration data software. And I've just shown a screen grab here um, that Peter's prepared for me. There are many, many features you can use within this software to do, look at clustering of um, outbreaks. So we've done a lot of this type of clustering work. And I'll move on. That's just to show you the there's an awful lot of work actually goes into the back, background behind this, getting all the data in the right formats and um, processing all this and getting it into the postcode districts. So what have we done now? We've um, 
plotted the an outlier analysis where we're, whereby we're looking at if you for any individual postcode district what we've done is looked at the risk of blight in that postcode district in relation to the districts around it and then this data is plotting those which show an unusual level of, out, of outliers they're, they're unusual compared to all the others in that they fit a particular category very strongly it's not easy to explain i know i'll try and go through this um, a high high cluster so these these pink areas are areas where there's been a consistently high number of outbreaks and they adjoin an area which, which has also had high numbers of outbreaks i compare that to a low high cluster it's the, which is in blue and you'll see they adjoin areas where there's um, a high high risk so there's been always been outbreaks in that area so those blue areas are at risk because they're adjoining a high high area relatively speaking at least and then there are other other um, areas where there is just no significant outbreak i mean any if, if any of you are from the shropshire area for example shropshire cheshire we've had a lot of samples from there but what i think has been going on there is the patterns have varied from year to year so there hasn't been a consistent number of clusters from year to year so we're not getting these um these risks of spread appearing as exceptionally high so the risk of spread into any in particular sector is when you're bordering a high sector all the information on this in more detail is available um, in the full report which is if it's not on the hdb website it will be very shortly so um, and can perhaps come back to that after, afterwards that was one type of analysis furthermore we've actually looked at the rate of spread and i think this is um this is quite interesting and quite striking because we've now looking at not only where the outbreaks are but what genotypes they had and how that genotype moved over the seasons and i've just got two slides here showing this and there's an example of the genotype 37a2 which is as we know insensitive to um, fluazinam so products um, such as sherlan for example 2017 we had um, outbreaks in the Shropshire, Cheshire, Cheshire sort of area, and we plotted those the spread of those outbreaks over the course of the season. And you can see that the blight outbreaks are moving at about 3.2 kilometres a week. So we know that from a small node, the pathogen has spread beyond that um, quite rapidly. And in 2018, the rate um, the pathogen had moved beyond that, and uh, we we're getting a higher rate of spread in that year. Compare that to 36A2, another relatively new lineage. In back in 2018, you know, this pathogen was fairly new, and we we're getting at much uh, faster rates of spread in that year. So we've got 17.3 kilometers per week. I must admit, one one point here is an obvious question: is uh, is this actual spread from crops to crop, or is this um, a separate source of the outbreak, perhaps via seed um, or some other source of contamination? That's also possible. But the point here, here is that um, I think the take home message is that when new clones of the pathogen appear in crops, they can spread pretty quickly. So you have to be prepared for that spread, even with intensive late blight management. Um, crop to crop spread can occur quickly. And we know now this lineage is present up in Scotland, for example. Um, so they, they do spread very rapidly and cause uh, quite dramatic damage over quite a wide area. Okay, so I mean, that's come, gone through the main. Um, some of the main findings so the key points here i think the long-term data set is proving a useful resource i don't we haven't finished exhausting it yet there are other things i think we can still mine from this data and comparing it indeed to european scale as well we know the coverage of the samples is matching the potato cultivation um, it is com slightly confounded by year-to-year -year variation and it tends to dominate and it sometimes can become challenging to generalize risks of late blight are indeed high in all areas of intensive potato production the focus of early season risks does vary between seasons so we always have to keep an eye on those um, those blight tools like blight spy and um, keep sending the samples in so a okay, quick um, advert for that one the risk of spread in your uh, growing regions does depend on the risk in the neighborhood um, postcode district and the rate of spread of new clones is very rapid and focused on areas of most intense production. We also did some uh, machine learning modeling, and that's available in the full report. 
we were looking for factors in, um, related to early incidents and spread and you know, it wasn't entirely surprising we came up with things like temperature and rainfall that were related but we looked at many many other factors that uh, you know didn't particularly strongly link and I think the last point I want to make is um, although I've been in, in you know looking at detail here of past outbreaks what you're interested in now I think is keeping blight under control this year and just keep bearing in mind the fact that all that blight has to start somewhere so it comes back to that message about primary inoculum really keep a keep an eye out for ground keepers um, Let's hope a lot of them have been killed by the frost. Um, and watch out for discard piles as well. Again, get them covered. Look out for, look out for those. Get quality seed. And if you're in an area where ooze spores are an issue, then keep the rotations long. Okay, and at that, I would like to um, leave that and I'm happy to ask it, answer any questions. Brilliant, David. There's a question that has come through, which I'm sure is in the minds of many. Um, does the high high cluster represent the enthusiasm of blight scouts in a particular area how much is all this information that you've gathered dependent on the the number of samples scouts are sending in from one place rather than another yeah that that is a good question and, and there is a there's always a, a risk or a concern that this is a scout effect now Scouts uh, go out and intensively sample other, some areas compared to other areas, but every sample is adding to a data set and every sample represents a blight outbreak. So, you know, that's, uh, that's no doubt. So I think they're reflecting the local risk rather than driving the data and, um, and saying this area is higher risk than others. Um, so, so the answer is kind of a bit yes and no, I suppose. Those, all those samples are useful and they tell us a lot about every everything we need to know about blight populations and how they're going to impact on best practice um, for you as growers or advisors. So I certainly don't want to put off those people who are intensively sampling because that information, there's a reason they do it. It takes time and effort and there's a reason they do it, which is that the information is useful. So um, to some extent, and I would like to, I think what we should do is focus on getting extra samples from areas that are undersampled rather than certainly trying to put anyone off from sending samples from those areas which are intensively sampled. Great, well now, um, that's, that's useful David. Now I've had a question in that's for Graham. So going back to the previous um, light spy tool, um, as an agronomist, how important are you to the blight tools the AHDB offer and how do these tools compare to those of um, commercial companies? Perhaps we could take the two bits of that question separately. Um, what role do you feel that you've got as an agronomist? in relation to the AHDB tools? Ah, hey have there, you Graham. lost Graham? He's still on the call, might have just have dipped away for a second, but we've just had another question I've sent you, um, which is yes. probably so more relevant to David. Yes, so we'll leave that for a moment until he's back with us. And there's a question here. Someone's very surprised um, that you don't think gardens are, and allotments are important in the epidemiology of late blight. Yeah, that's a good good chance to clarify that. I <laughs> let us say that we we did capture information from gardens and allotments, but of course um, we didn't include that data in this um, in this analysis. We were focusing on agricultural sites. Um, uh, I think they probably do play a role. It is relatively small. I mean, the areas involved are small, but you're right, there is a potential for um, inoculum load to be relatively high. But if we look at when we do sample gardens and allotments, they tend to be having clones present which have come in on seed, on seed um, come in from other countries. We know that a lot of the Outbreak, the new clones 
that emerged first within the Netherlands um, uh, and other areas in northern, north, northern, northern Europe. So I think they're probably coming in through agricultural trade rather than um, amateur growers. So amateur growers get the clones that, that the industry gets rather than the other way around. That's not to say they're not important. And I, I think um, it, should be, it should be important to be aware of outbreaks that are happening in gardens and allotments close to your fields. But um, I think if you're putting good blight treatments on, you'll be able to combat those outbreaks. And when it goes wrong on an amateur garden scale, the amount of inoculum compared to when it goes wrong, unfortunately, in an agricultural field, the amount of inoculum that's being produced you know, is, a, is in a league different. So I wouldn't say they're completely unimportant, but you know, they weren't factoring big in our analysis here. Hmm. Well, perhaps I could add to that um, and say that in places they certainly can be very important. Um, and we're writing uh, press releases for the amateur grower magazines to talk about blight spy and to use that as a way of getting the message out to growers that it's important that they control volunteers, that they don't leave piles um, of diseased potatoes out and that when they do have blight they uh, cut down the home and bury it yeah. um, because uh, it, it could matter. That's a good idea and also it's, it's um, emphasize it's, what people can do for the to, to help. It should be encouraged them. also to grow resistant varieties so which is a, the best oh. way they have of actually controlling <laughs> blight in the absence of any chemical and chemistry. It would be lovely, but I know that they have little access to resistant varieties, um, which would be frustrating if they looked and they just couldn't find them. I'm afraid that the garden centres sell some very old and very susceptible varieties to the home gardener. Um, now, there's a, another question here, um, whether we can identify organic crops as opposed to conventional ones to identify higher risk. Now on the Fight Against Blight website, you can see whether uh, a sample is from a conventional um, or an organic field. But I don't know whether you looked into that, um, David, to see over the country as a whole if that made a difference. Yeah, it is a good question. We we. We did put all those traits, all those characteristics we knew about each outbreak into the database. I think there wasn't enough resolution or depth of sampling of organic versus conventional to be able to pull that analysis out. I'm afraid I don't recollect the, the details of that analysis just now. Um, inevitably, there will be a, a slightly higher risk and the growers, again, in the same way as Amateur growers should should be encouraged to burn down crops which have um, go above a certain threshold of infection um, and grow indeed grow resistant or more resistant varieties. Um, being aware of the resistance ratings from AHDB, for example. So yes, there is a there is a risk there, but we haven't looked at that in detail. Well, the organic growers have access to all that information, and they're very aware of the danger to their own um, crops, whereas um, the point's been made that allotment growers don't protect. And uh, so there is a, a risk from even a small area. Then <clears throat> another question, questioner asks, would it be possible in Blight Spy to divide the country into smaller regions than they currently are? Um, and it's difficult to do that. And the reason is just the constraints of the screen when people are using Blight Spy on their mobile devices. That the, Technically, we can easily divide the country into much smaller units. Um, and that would be fine if everybody were using the tool uh, on a large screen. But we've gone as far as we dare 
in subdivisions so that it's still possible to work from a mobile phone. And this is an area where we'd really value feedback as to how easy you find the tool to use on a mobile. Do you want to use it on a mobile or is this something that you could um, uh, use before going out for the day or in the evening uh, on a desktop? There, there's, there's real scope here to make modifications if it will help. Have we got some um, Graham back again? Ah, Graham. Good. There were some questions for you. Um, as an agronomist, how important to you are the flight tools that AHDB offer in comparison with the those offered by commercial companies? It's. I mean, we. Personally, I, I use both. Uh, and I think so with something like Blight, you need to be looking at all the different options available. But, you know, personally, I, I use the, the Syngenta and uh, the Blightcast, the, 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 the model that they offer and, uh, and, and Blight Watch currently. But I will be moving over to, to use Blight Spy. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I think to use more than one is essential. Uh, more than one service uh, and obviously it's only it's only a part of your toolkit that you're using anyway uh, there's lots of other things that come into come into account when you're making those decisions thanks graham and i believe there are there's going to be an app available from agri this year there's another from upl um so uh, we we certainly don't believe in people using just AHDB tools. Uh, Blight is too important not to make use of everything that's available. Mm, I agree. Right. Well, we're we're just at the end of our time, and so I'd like to thank first of all those who haven't said a word, the um, Blight Scouts, who send in samples. Without you, there, there's no data. It's immensely valuable, this. Um, and we hope that you gain um, from what you send in as individuals, as well as seeing the whole picture sent in from all around the country. And thank you, David, to you and to your colleagues um, who've um, made sense of a very large, complex set of data. Um, you've given us a taste of it this evening, but I will ensure that the whole report goes up on the website because there's a great deal more than you were able to cover today. And um, thank you, Graham, for your practical viewpoint on this. Pleasure. Yeah. Thanks to all. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank Goodbye. You.